Fluid Mechanics, Chapter 12, Open Channel Flow. So the first question to ask is, what is an open channel? An open channel is a flow system in which the top surface of the fluid is exposed to the atmosphere. Examples would be rain gutters on buildings, storm sewers, natural rivers and streams. And channels constructed to drain fluids in a controlled manner, as shown below. So when you talk about flow, it's often important to distinguish between what's referred to as laminar flow and turbulent flow. So a typical velocity profile for water flowing through an open rectangular channel may look something like the figure shown. Even though the surface may appear calm as if, in, as if the flow is laminar, beneath the surface it will often be turbulent. So in spite of this irregularity, we can often approximate the actual flow as being uniform one-dimensional flow and still achieve reasonable results in estimating the flow. First, we'll look at uniform and steady flow. Uniform flow occurs when the depth of the fluid remains the same along the length of the channel, because then the velocity of the liquid does not change from one location to another. This often occurs when the channel has a small slope, such that the force of gravity causing the flow is balanced by the force of friction that retards it. Steady flow in a channel occurs when the flow remains constant over time, as shown in the figure. And so its depth at a specific location remains constant. This is the case for most problems involving open channel flow. If the depth varies along the length, such as shown in the figure below, then the flow is non-uniform. This can happen if there's a change in slope or where there's a change in the channel's cross-sectional area. Accelerated non-uniform flow occurs when the depth of flow decreases downstream. An example would be the water flowing down a chute or spill spillway. Retarded non-uniform flow occurs if the depth is increasing, such as when the water in a downstream sloping channel backs up to meet the face of a dam. A hydraulic jump is another kind of flow that you often see. A hydraulic jump is a localized turbulence that rapidly dissipates kinetic energy, changing the flow from rapid to tranquil. It generally occurs at the bottom of a chute or spillway. The type of flow that occurs in an open channel can be classified by comparing the average speed of the liquid in the channel to the speed of a wave on its surface. So let's imagine we have a liquid flowing, as shown in the diagram below, from right to left, and then we place an obstacle in the flow. For example, we close a gate. The liquid will suddenly back up against the gate and elevate the flow as shown. The resulting wave front will then propagate back upstream to the right and move with a speed C. Our goal is to find this speed. So let's assume the channel is horizontal and has a rectangular cross section and the liquid is an ideal fluid. By using the continuity equation and the momentum equation, we can show the speed of the wave as given by the following equation. Provided the wave has a small height compared to the depth of the fluid, then y1 and y2 are approximately equal. So let's just call them y in the, in the equation above and we can simplify it to the following equation. The speed of the wave is the square root of g times y, where g is the acceleration of the gravity, and y is the average depth inside the channel. So here we can see that the wave that's flowing back upstream is directly proportional to the square root of the depth of the water. Notice also that this result is independent of the magnitude of the velocity of the flowing water. The same speed would be obtained if a negative surge occurred, as in the case of suddenly lifting the gate back up. Also, it can be shown that C represents the speed of the wave moving over the surface of the water, even if there's no flow. It's only a function of the liquid depth in the channel. Like waves, the driving force for all open channel flow is due to gravity. And so 
1871, William Froude formulated what's known as the Froude number and showed how it can be used for describing this flow. The result is expressed as the Froude number is the velocity of the square root of g times y. Or in our case, we can write it as the velocity over c. So v here is the average velocity of the liquid in the channel, y is the depth of the liquid. The Froude number is an important parameter that governs the character of flow in all open channels. What we find is that if the Froude number is less than one, then the flow can be classified as subcritical, in other words, tranquil. If the Froude number is one, it's referred to as critical flow. And the Froude number is greater than one, is known as supercritical or rapid flow. We can use the terms tranquil flow to represent laminar flow and rapid flow to represent turbulent flow. The actual behavior of the flow at each location along the open channel depends upon the total energy of the flow at that location. So we can, if we have a channel such as shown in figure 2.5, we can write the energy equation, which is just a sum of the kinetic energy, V squared over 2G plus Y, which is the potential energy. Specific energy can also be written in terms of the volumetric flow rate using the formula Q equals V times A. Thus, we can take our equation and we can write it into the form that we will use shown here. This equation is very instructive as it shows the variation of the specific energy with flow depth. So let's imagine we have a rectangular cross section. In this case, we can find the volumetric flow rate per unit width, small q is equal to q, big Q divided by B, the width of the channel. Then since the area of the channel is given by the width of the channel B times the depth of the channel Y, we can substitute those into the equation shown above and come up with what's known as the specific energy equation. This equation is very useful. What it allows us to do is it allows us to draw what's known as specific energy diagrams. In this equation, there are two independent variables, namely Q and Y. However, for a constant value of Q, a plot of the equation has the shape shown in the figure below. This is known as the specific energy diagram. So in this diagram, we, we're graphing Y on the y-axis and the energy on the x-axis. So the shape in blue is the uh, for, for a very specific flow rate. Notice in this graph that when Q is zero, we have a straight line. That's the black line running up at 45 degree angle. This represents the condition of the liquid having no motion or kinetic energy, only po potential energy. When the liquid has a flow Q, shown in the blue part of the curve, there are two possible depths that produce the same specific energy. Here, the smaller value, Y1, represents low potential energy and high kinetic energy. This is rapid or subcritical, I'm sorry, supercritical flow. The larger value of Y, Y2, represents high potential energy and low kinetic energy and is referred to as tranquil or subcritical flow. So given this specific energy equation, we can ask ourselves, how can we find the minimum energy shown in the diagram here? Is this a value for given Q that the energy is the minimum? We can do that using the first derivative test. We can simply take a, a derivative of the, the specific energy equation with respect to Y, keeping Q constant and solving for Y. What we find is that the critical depth is given by the following equation. Substituting this value for Y critical into the energy equation, we can find the actual value for the energy minimum. And it's given by three halves yc. 
So to summarize, this is the smallest amount of specific energy the liquid can have and still maintain the required flow of Q. It occurs at the nose of the curve in the figure below where the Q is at the critical depth Y sub C. Shown here in the diagram, I'll, I'll circle it here. Values of Y above the critical depth are rapid subcritical flow with crude numbers less than one. Below the critical depth, a supercritical flow with the crude numbers greater than one. To find the critical velocity at this depth, we can substitute back in the equation for small q and solve and find the critical velocity. Notice also that when the flow as at this critical velocity, the fruit number becomes equal to one. Therefore, for any point on the upper branch of the specific energy curve, the depth of flow will exceed the critical depth. The fruit number will be less than one, and the velocity will be less than the critical velocity. This is referred to as subcritical or tranquil flow. On the other hand, for any point on the lower branch of the specific energy curve, the depth of the flow will be less than the critical depth. The velocity will be greater than the critical velocity and the fruit number will be greater than one. This is supercritical or rapid flow. So this graph summarizes the three classifications we have. What happens if we have a non-rectangular cross-section? When the channel cross-section is non-rectangular, then the minimum specific energy must be obtained by taking the derivative of equation 12.5, setting it equal to zero, and requiring that the area equal the cross-sectional area. So doing that and then taking a derivative, we can take a look at the top of the channel where the differential area is uh, the width in our diagram, our book, he calls it B top times the differential dy. Plugging that back in this equation and solving, we come up with this following relationship. So provided that the width of the channel at the top and the cross-sectional area can be related to the geometry of the cross-sectional depth y sub c, then a solution for y sub c can be determined from this equation. To do this for an irregular cross-section, an initial guess is often made for y sub c, and then the calculated value of the right side is compared to the constant q squared over g on the left. And oftentimes you have to make iterations of y c until the equation is satisfied. The best approach I've seen is to actually do this numerically. We'll take a look at this in one of the examples. So for a non-rectangular cross-section, again, we can find the critical velocity by substituting back in and come up with the following equation. At this speed, the fruit number is equal to one and so for any other velocity, the flow can be classified as supercritical or subcritical according to the table shown below. Let's take a look at example 12.1. In this example, water has a flow of four meters per second as it flows along a rectangular channel as shown in the figure to the left. If the depth of the flow is three meters, classify the flow. What's the velocity of the flow at the alternate depth that provides the same specific energy for the flow? So the first thing we need to do in this example is calculate Q. So first of all, and that's, I think this gives students a lot of problems is they forget exactly what Q is. Q is the flow rate per unit width. In this example, we're giving the velocity. So in the diagram to the left here, we're, we have the velocity and we have the depth. So therefore, Q is going to be 12 square meters per second. 
In a lot of the cases, you'll give us big Q, which is the volumetric flow rate. In that case, you would multiply, you would have to divide by the width to be able to calculate that. So pay attention to that in the problems the way it gives those. So in this example, we can plug in our equation that we saw for in the earlier slides for the critical depth, and we find that it's 2.45 meters. So since our current depth is at three meters, we're above the critical depth. In other words, we're on the top side of the curve here, where the flow is going to be subcritical or tranquil. So for an arbitrary depth y, the specific energy of the flow is determined using equation 12.6, which I've sh we've shown here. So once you know what the value for small q is, we can plug that in, we can plug g in. So in our current situation, the water is at three meters. So we can plug in three meters for y and we can solve for what the energy is. So at three meters, the energy is here. Remember, we're, we're subcritical. We're above the critical depth. So to answer part B of the question, what the authors want to, us to find is this value here. It's the value that has the same energy, but is below the critical depth. So in order to do that, I did this uh, graphically. I used MATLAB to plot this. And so you're free to use the, my example here. If you can't get to the, uh, if you don't have MATLAB at home, you can always down, download Scilab. That's also a uh, free alternative you can download. And it works pretty much the same. So here, what I did is I show you an example of how you can find uh, how you can find that value. You can simply look on the chart. You can read off what the, what the minimum value is. Uh, you can, and once you know what the value here is, you, you come up and you can find the two points that you have that have the same amount of energy. Here's another, here's this, the same example. What I did, what I, you could solve the, the, uh, uh, the, the cubic polynomial to actually find this as well. So solving for these three roots, I did this in MATLAB using the, the roots function. I found three, three possible roots. So the first root is where we're at now. That's, we already know this one. The, 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 at a Y value of three meters, that's where we are. We, we have this, we have a certain amount of energy. Obviously, the negative root, we can throw that out. The only other place we can, that has the same energy is at 2.02 .02 meters. So the, as the author points out in his, his summary here, you have three solutions. Y equals three meters. That's the supercritical one. That's the one that was in the problem definition. Y equals... 2.024 meters. That's that's the other other root. That's the one on the on the on the lower part of the curve. That's the supercritical value that we that we need, and the, the negative value is, is not realistic. It's 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 not a valid. It solves the equation, but it's it's not physical. It doesn't represent any, anything. So we can also solve for for the velocity at that alternate depth of 2.02 .02 meters. Q is going to have to stay the same, and so we can solve for V. We get 5.93 meters per second. You can also do this kind of question, this kind of problem on your calculator, and, and certainly, you know, you can, you, your calculator has cubic root solvers. You can plot, you can plot the equations on there as well. So here shows another graph on, as a summary. We, we started off at, th at three meters, and so we were able to find the energy, and we, we can graph the curve. We can also find the, the alternate depth that has the same amount of energy, which we found. We also found the critical depth. So let's take a look at another look at another example, too. Here we have a horizontal rectangular channel six foot wide, and, but gradually tapers down to three foot wide. If the water is flowing at 300 cubic feet per second, and has a depth of two, 
feet within the six feet cross section to determine the depth when it's in the three foot cross section. And again, notice here, this is, what is he giving us here? This is Q, big Q. So here to find small Q, we can divide the 300 cubic feet per second by six feet, the width of the channel at the start. We get 50 square feet per second. So we can find the critical depth, 4.27 feet using the equation. And since the critical depth is 4.27 feet, and we're currently at two feet, the flow is supercritical or rapid. In other words, we're below the critical depth. We can plug in the specific energy equation and we, we can calculate what the energy is at two feet. So in this case, the value of energy must remain constant through the channel since the channel is horizontal and there's no friction loss. So, so, however, the width of the channel does change. It went from six feet down to three feet, so we can recalculate our small q. We find it to be 100 square foot per second. So plugging in the specific energy equation, we can come up with an equation we have to solve, a cubic equation. So again, you can solve this equation on your calculator, or you can solve this equation on MATLAB. So we can also solve for the critical depth. We find it to be 6.77 feet. Remember, this is at the new depth of three feet, the critical depth. So this curve to the right shows a plot of what the original specific energy curve looked like at two feet. Notice here we were below the critical depth and the flow is rapid. When the channel narrows to three feet, we, all, we obviously get a new energy specific energy diagram for that. The small Q is a lot, a lot faster. So solving the cubic equation, we again get three roots for that new condition at the narrow, at the narrow end. 10.2 feet, 4.71 feet, and minus 3.22 feet. Obviously the negative value is, is not realistic. So there's two possibilities as shown on, this, on the new curve. We get a value for that's subcritical where the flow is rapid and we get a value where the flow is super critical below the critical value. So remember when we started off in the wide end of the channel at six feet, the flow was super critical, very fast. There's no way for the, and we have to conserve energy. There's no way for the curve to jump back up to this other value. It can't decrease to the minimum when they increase. So which of these routes we choose, we have to choose the route that remains in the sub super critical state. So therefore, at the three foot section, the flow will be 4.71 feet. Let's take a look at the last example. This is a, a non-rectangular section. So here we want to determine the critical depth if the flow is 12 cubic meters per second. So here we can go back and we can use the, the equation we developed or was given to us actually. Q squared over G is equal to AC, AC cubed over B, B top. So here we can find the width B top simply by using our, our trigonometry. We can find the area, it's a triangle, so it's one half base times height. We can plug them in our equation and we can find what the value for the critical depth is.